Oh, sorry about that. What a way to start a Monday. Holy cow. Um, so that was some footage of uh, Jasper National Park and uh, some bears, some snowballs, etc. Um, one perfect day. Um, yeah, that was from the Orgon collection, which was ultimately, that film came from the Mogul Brothers collection. And um, so, yeah, you could rent that at one point for, I feel like it was like 50 cents. Um, I don't know, it was like outrageously cheap. And you could buy it for probably five bucks or something like that. Um, so what we do is we watch old 16 millimeter films, just like uh, we just saw. And uh, we also sometimes have lunch. And uh, I'm Skip, and this is AV Geeks. Um, maps are fun, really. So much so that Cornette made two different films about it. This is the second edition. Enjoy. My name is Donaldson, and I'm a cartographer. That means I make maps. One Saturday afternoon, I invited two of my neighbors, Ronnie and his young friend Dick, to visit me. I knew they were having trouble making a map. Ronnie was going on a camping trip with his family, and Dick was going to deliver papers for him. But he couldn't understand the map Ronnie had made of his paper route. I asked them into my workroom to talk over their problem. I had moved a sand table into the room so we could make a model of Ronnie's neighborhood. Then I gave Ronnie a yardstick to measure the table to see how much room we had for laying out a paper route six blocks long and four blocks wide. Ronnie measured the table. Luckily, its length was just six feet. and its width was four feet. Now Dick could see that they could make the streets exactly one foot apart. Then each block would be one foot in length. That's what is meant by scale. Here the scale is one foot equals one block. Everything on the map will be drawn to scale. Then I showed Ronnie some models we could use to represent the buildings. It wasn't long before the streets and buildings were all in place. And the model of his paper route was finished. I pointed out that this view of the model was just like an airplane view of a town. Air views of towns and cities are often used to help cartographers make maps. From such a view high above a city, for example, an aerial photograph is made. From an aerial photograph, a map of a whole community can be drawn. At the map studio where I work, we usually make maps of areas much larger than cities or towns. Here, we are making a new map of Pennsylvania. Much will be done to it before it is finished. On a special rotating table called a whirler, colors are added to the map. In this device, each color is made permanent in the places on the map where it belongs. And here is the finished map, with all the colors and names in place. Map making is fascinating work, as Dick and Ronnie were beginning to discover. And now that our model was complete, and Dick could see how the newspaper route went, he was eager to get started on the map. 
Yet he could see that a map as big as the model would be too large to carry around on a bicycle. But the paper I brought over on the drafting table was smaller than the model. Dick was also worried about how he could keep his directions straight. So on the paper, Ronnie marked this direction north. He knew which direction was north on the model because the railroad station was at the north end of his paper route. But to use this small paper for a map of the route, Ronnie realized that they would have to change the scale. When they had made the model, they had let one foot equal one block. Now, perhaps they could use a different scale and let a few inches equal one block. After Ronnie measured the paper for the map, he decided that they could use this scale. Three inches equal one block. So the blocks which were 12 inches long on the model would be only three inches long on the map, one fourth as much. Now Ronnie wondered if it was all right to use a little square like this to stand for a house. I said that would be a good symbol for his map. A legend explains the lines and symbols that are used. The legend on Ronnie's map would help Dick read it. All the houses were put into scale, one inch on the map for every four inches on the model. Then came the railroad depot and the tracks. This is the way Ronnie showed the railroad tracks, a line with little marks across it, like railroad ties. Then Ronnie added the symbol for railroad tracks to the legend. He decided to use an X as his symbol to show the houses where papers were to be delivered. Dick could easily read this map. Then Ronnie marked the paper route to the place where it crossed a bridge. I showed them the symbol often used for bridges. Then I showed them the symbol usually used for a church, a square like a house with a cross on top of it, and the symbol for a school, a square with a flag. Then I pointed out that maps are really a kind of writing which uses lines and symbols to show things. A map tells anyone who can read it a great deal about the area it represents. The legend helps us to read a particular map. It explains the meaning of the symbols that are used in the map. Ronnie put in the street names, completed the legend and the newspaper route, and the map was ready. Dick, or anyone who knew how to read maps, could use it. Ronnie noticed a map of the United States on the wall, and he said he'd show Dick where he and his family were going camping. They were going to Leadville in Colorado. But Leadville wasn't on the map. Perhaps it was too small a town. I suggested that Ronnie try a different map, a more complete map of Colorado in an atlas. This kind of map has a grid made of these vertical lines and these horizontal lines. To find Leadville, we first looked it up in the index, which is arranged alphabetically. Leadville, Colorado, page 118, at G4 on the map. On page 118, Ronnie found G along the top of the map, and then 4 along the side of the map. He followed across on 4 and down on G until his fingers met, and there was Leadville. I explained that nearly every map has some sort of cross lines for locating things on it. Now Dick had a question. Why are the states in different colors? He knew that Colorado isn't really orange. When you travel along a highway and cross a state line, the land looks just the same on both sides. Unless there's a sign, you don't know when you go from one state to another. 
On a map, color is sometimes used to help indicate where one state ends and another begins. Dick noticed how the color blue shows lakes, rivers, and oceans. Then I showed them another map, which uses color in a different way. This is a physical map, which shows the elevation or height of the land. Each color represents a different height. Here, the legend explains the exact height each color or shade represents. Then I showed the boys a group of maps of the United States, each telling a different story. The stories were easy to figure out when you use the legend as a guide. The other thing that helps you read a map besides its legend is its scale. We can show any area on any size paper just by using a larger or smaller scale. Whether it's a map of a continent or a hemisphere, or even the whole world. Legend and scale are the keys that unlock the story of any map, just as they explain the story of the boys' map. The story of where Dick is to deliver papers while Ronnie is on his vacation. Sorry, um, ate a big piece of cheese. Um, yeah, fascinating, exciting. Uh, all right, behind me I have a film scanner set up with an educational film about uh, nuclear energy. Let us watch it, enjoy. As this giant ingot cools, it will give off a great deal of energy in the form of heat. This energy loss results in a corresponding loss of a small amount of mass or weight. The loss will be less than the weight of the ink on a postage stamp. The surprising relationship between the loss of mass and energy given off is the subject of this film. This is the simplest atom in nature, hydrogen. It consists of a light particle with a negative charge called an electron. In the nucleus, we find a heavy particle, the proton, 2,000 times the mass of the electron with a positive charge. One of the earliest models of an atom made it look like this. Sometimes, this is the kind of atom model used, showing fuzzy regions rather than orbiting particles. These models are convenient and useful. But let's make our own model of an atom on a much larger scale. 
If the nucleus of a hydrogen atom were this size, then on the same scale, the orbiting electron would have to be somewhere out here, a hundred or so meters away, and it would never remain standing still. It would move billions of times faster than this, and in a random three-dimensional manner. As you can see, an atom is mostly empty space. If the nucleus were really this size, it would weigh 50 times more than a large steamship. Some of the heaviest nuclei, like those of the radium in this old clock, are so packed that they shoot off particles. We can detect this with a Geiger counter. There are deposits of radioactive minerals found in nature. This rock sample contains uranium. Although we cannot see particles given off by nuclei, we can see evidence of their travel in a special vapor. We have placed the radioactive clock hand in a diffusion cloud chamber containing this vapor. We are watching vapor trails caused by particles as they fly loose from the atoms of radium. Here the action is animated. Observations such as these help us in our understanding of the atom. The sun is the source of almost all the Earth's energy. The Skylab astronauts photographed the sun. Here, one of their pictures shows a solar prominence. Some solar prominences shoot millions of kilometers into space. How does the sun release this energy? Is it the kind of burning we see here on Earth? This is a chemical process called oxidation. If the sun were burning like the oxidation of a candle, it would have burned out millions of years ago. So what is happening on the sun to cause so much heat? A spectrograph of the sun shows us the presence of the two simplest and lightest elements, hydrogen and helium. In fact, the word helium comes from the Greek word helios, which means sun. Helium was discovered on the sun before it was found on Earth. Helium is a slightly more complex atom than hydrogen. Helium has two electrons, two protons, and two particles called neutrons. A neutron has no electrical charge and can be thought of as an electron and a proton combined. With the high temperature and pressure on the sun, four hydrogen atoms can fuse to construct one helium atom. Now, let's see how the pieces fit. One proton and one electron. One proton and one electron. A proton and electron can be thought of as a neutron. The net effect is fusion, like separate drops of water becoming one drop. Let's see it again.
Although it is much more complicated than we show here, all the particles in the four hydrogen atoms fuse to form one helium atom. But does the helium atom have the same mass as the four hydrogen atoms combined? This time we'll keep track of the atomic units of mass using a cash register. We started with four hydrogen atoms and ended up with one helium. The fusion resulted in a loss of a small amount of mass, which corresponds to a large amount of energy. Just as with the steel ingot, when energy is given off, so is a small amount of mass. The mass has not evaporated or fallen to the floor. Physicists now know that whenever energy is given off, there is a corresponding loss of mass. And whenever a nuclear rearrangement results in a loss of mass, energy is given off. Each second, five million tons of the sun's mass is converted into tremendous amounts of energy, a small portion of which reaches our Earth. We needn't be alarmed, however, because the sun is so large that it will take millions of years before the Earth will feel the effect of the sun's reduced size. The energy produced by nuclear fusion on the sun is used by plants in the process of photosynthesis. Plants convert solar energy into chemical energy. And so all the food we eat and the fuel we burn come from the sun's energy. The energy stored in oil, coal, and natural gas originally came from the sun. We are rapidly consuming the sun's energy that was stored for millions of years in fossil fuels. In the next few generations, most of our available fossil fuels will be used up. When the sun's energy is stored in plants and fossil fuels, only electrons, not nuclei, are affected. The sun's energy changes the orbit of the electron. The nucleus, however, is not affected. The atom gives up the acquired energy when the electron jumps back to its original orbit. In chemical burning, the nucleus is not affected, only the electrons. However, we can release energy from the nucleus through nuclear fission. This is a model of the most complex atom found in nature, the uranium atom. Scientists have discovered that if the nucleus is bombarded with a neutron, it splits the atom apart, freeing other neutrons to split still more nuclei. This is what is called a chain reaction. The splitting of a nucleus is called nuclear fission. Let's keep track of the atomic units. We began with uranium-235. It usually splits into two parts, whose masses are almost alike. This is the sum of the units from the two new elements. The net loss amounts to nearly 10%. So with each new fission, mass is converted into energy and particles are released to continue the process. This is what happens in an atom bomb. Our knowledge of the atom has placed a special responsibility on all future generations. For now, we have in our care a tremendous power capable of destroying all mankind.
The fission reaction in a bomb is explosive, but using special techniques, the rate of fission can be held to safe limits and energy harnessed for peaceful purposes. Nuclear fission's byproducts can be very hazardous if not properly disposed of. It will only benefit mankind if it is coupled with a sense of social responsibility to provide the abundance of power needed to match the needs of future generations. Many different kinds of insects live in and around fresh water. The damselfly, like many others, lays its eggs in the water. The female damselfly inserts its abdomen in the water and leaves its eggs where they will hatch and eventually develop into mature insects. Other insects, like the water strider, spend most of their lives on the surface. Whirligig beetles are also creatures of the surface. They travel on top of the water most of the time. But occasionally, these beetles are found beneath the surface, along with other kinds of insect life. Many aquatic animals are swimming through the water here. Others, such as this large insect known as a water bug, are quietly attached to the plants. Aquatic insects may be observed in an aquarium, which recreates their natural environment. Insects for an aquarium can be collected in a variety of ways. Some can be scooped from beneath the surface with a net. Many specimens can be taken from almost any brook or pond in this way. Others can be captured with a net on the surface. Aquatic insects can be transported in jars or buckets and placed in an aquarium for observation. But water alone will not recreate the natural habitat. Sand and rocks must be added so that those insects like dragonfly nymphs, which live along the bottom, will be able to carry on their lives as usual. 
There should also be green plants as food for some insects and to provide oxygen. If the plants do not give off enough oxygen, an oxygenator should be set up. This will help keep the water fresh and wholesome. Some of the insects which develop into adults with wings may fly away if the aquarium is not covered. And many of these aquatic insects will feed on one another if they are not separated into individual tanks. So we may want to set up several aquariums. Now we can begin observing our insects to find out how they live. One thing we will notice is that some, like this beetle, are plant eaters. They get their nourishment from leaves and stems. Others are meat eaters. They feed on animals and take their nourishment from flesh. This dragonfly nymph, half buried at the bottom, eats other animals, such as fly larvae. This is another predaceous insect. It stalks its prey slowly. It has a long mouth part which reaches out to capture its food. It may feed on small animals like these, or even attack another carnivore such as this damselfly nymph. And there are also a host of other creatures, like this water beetle, which can act as scavengers, feeding on animals that are dead or dying. Scavengers help keep the water clean. If it were not for them, the water might become very polluted. As these insects go about getting their food, each one plays an important part in the balance of nature which makes life possible. Green plants, plant eaters, and flesh eaters all fit into a food chain which supports life in the water. But most of these insects need to move just to find their food. Many kinds of locomotion can be observed. Some, like the whirligig beetles, swim on the surface, but they can also move underwater whenever this becomes necessary. Others, like the larvae of the water beetle, will sometimes be seen walking along the bottom and sometimes swimming through the water by paddling their feet. Some dragonfly nymphs take in water and shoot themselves along with a kind of jet propulsion. Some water beetles swim around the plants as they search for the dead or dying creatures which are their food. Or else these scavengers move in and out among the rocks which may hide morsels of food that have dropped to the bottom. This water beetle has web-like membranes on its hind feet. These make its legs function almost like oars. The back swimmer moves along upside down just beneath the water's surface. It has long paddle-like legs for moving around. The back swimmer eats food from the surface and breathes air. When its air supply is diminished, the back swimmer will push its abdomen above the water for more. Many nymphs, such as those of the mayfly and dobson fly, take oxygen from the water like fish. 
They breathe through gills along the sides of their bodies. The dragonfly nymph also takes oxygen from the water. The water goes in and out through the back of the nymph's body. If ink is dropped into the water near the dragonfly nymph's tail, we can see the currents which are set up as the nymph breathes. Inside the body, oxygen is removed from the water and used to support the insect's life. Many insects, like this water scavenger beetle, must continually go to the surface to take in air. Air is drawn along the outside of the antennae and stored on the underside of the body and beneath the wing covers. The water scorpion is often seen backing toward the surface. It breathes air through a long tail-like tube. The tube is pushed above the surface to reach air. As we continue observing these insects, we may see them molt and leave their empty exoskeletons behind. We will see them reproduce, each in its own way. Here a female water bug lays eggs on the back of its mate. The male carries them through the water as it swims along after food, and it will carry the eggs wherever it goes until they develop and hatch. So the cycle of life continues, generation after generation. Yet many of these insects spend only a part of their lives beneath the surface. They leave as soon as they are mature. These empty exoskeletons of dragonfly nymphs show that the dragonflies have matured and left the water. They have entered a new stage in their life cycles. But these aquatic insects cannot be understood without knowing something of the underwater stages of their lives. Many of them live most of their days beneath the surface and emerge into the air only to mate and reproduce. So I'm having a weird sound problem. I don't know if you can hear it, if you heard it during the film, but um, even though the film has ended, um, at some point it freaked out and the audio dropped out, so I was trying to fix that. And then during this film, Aquatic Insects, that I showed, I was hearing the rewinding sound of the film, even though there was no film rewinding. And so who knows what's going on? I have no idea. Crazy. Uh, all right. Uh, so it's time to learn about equations and how that they are actually number sentences. Are you ready for that? Number sentences. Enjoy. These men are experiencing a condition of weightlessness because their airplane is following a special path determined by an equation. This rocket will travel through space along a path based on many equations. This familiar equation expresses the relationship between the area, base, and height of a rectangle. This and other equations express numerical relationships. What is a numerical relationship? 
We can illustrate a very simple one with Jane and her brother, Bill. Jane is two years younger than Bill. Now, this sentence doesn't tell us the age of either one, but a reasonable guess based on the human lifespan is that Jane could be anywhere from one to 98 years of age and Bill from three to 100. Suppose we represent Jane's age by X. We call X a variable because it can be replaced with any one of these numbers. We can let another variable, Y, represent Bill's age. Since Bill's age is two years more than Jane's, we can also represent Bill's age by X plus two. Then X plus two and Y represent the same number. We write this as X plus two equals Y and call it an equation. We may think of an equation as a number sentence written as an equality between two expressions. We can describe other numerical relationships by means of equations. Let's think about time. We know that North America is divided into time zones. When it is 10 o'clock in Washington, D.C., three time zones to the west in Juneau, Alaska, it is three hours earlier, seven o'clock. In Washington, when it is two o'clock, it is three hours earlier, or 11 o'clock in Juneau. Notice that when we use the hours on a clock, the number before one is not zero, but 12, and there are no negatives. Now, if X represents the time in hours in Washington, DC, and Y, the corresponding time in Juneau, we can write the equation that expresses the time relationship between the two cities, X minus three equals Y. To find the time in Juneau, y, we subtract three hours from the time in Washington, D.C., x. For another example, let's consider just Washington, D.C. In our nation's Capitol building, the Senate of the United States meets. According to our Constitution, the total number of senators depends on the number of states. The Senate is always composed of two senators from each state. So at any time during our nation's history, if X were the number of states, then 2X would equal the number of senators, which we can also represent by Y. The equation 2X equals Y shows two ways of representing the same number of senators, and it also shows a relationship between the number of states, X, and the number of senators, Y. So we've seen three simple equations each involving two variables. Now let's take the relationship between Jane's and Bill's ages to show that when one of the variables is replaced by a number, the corresponding value of the other variable can be found. Using this equation about their ages, we can find out how old Jane was when Bill was five years old. We know X, Jane's age, plus two equals Y, Bill's age. If we substitute Bill's age of five for Y, we now have an equation with only one unknown, which is easy to solve. Three plus two equals five. So when Bill was five years old, Jane was three. Three is the solution to the equation X plus two equals five. Three is the only replacement for X in the equation x plus two equals five, that will make the sentence true. We call three the truth set, or solution set of x plus two equals five. So we know that when Bill was five, Jane was three. But let's look at the original equation about Jane's and Bill's ages. Not only does it show us that when Jane was three, Bill was five, but it also shows that when Jane is 20, Bill will be 22. When Jane is 61, Bill will be 63. So you see, there is not just one solution to this equation, but a great many pairs of numbers, of which these are only a few. We usually write each such pair in a single parenthesis with a comma between. 
notice that we wrote the replacements for X as the first number in each case, and the corresponding replacements for Y as the second. Because the order makes a difference, these pairs are called ordered pairs. Each of these ordered pairs makes the sentence X plus two equals Y a true statement and is called a solution of the equation. The set of these and all the other ordered pairs that make the sentence true is called the solution set of the equation. Now we stop the solution set with the ordered pair 61, 63. But we could have gone on, since an indefinite number of ordered pairs would satisfy the equation. But remember, we limited Jane's and Bill's ages to 98 and 100, so we would have only reasonable answers. This set of ordered pairs is only part of the solution set of x plus 2 equals y, the part which we consider sensible. Because there is only one value of y for each replacement of x, the set is called a function. The function defined by the equation x plus 2 equals y, but with the restriction that x is a natural number not larger than 98. The set of first numbers in these pairs, the set which represents Jane's age in this case, is called the domain of the function. The set of second numbers, is called the range of the function. For the equation about the time in Washington and Juneau, both the domain and range of the function are the numbers 1 through 12, representing the AM and PM hours of the day. And the domain of the equation relating senators to states could be the numbers from 13 through 50, showing a certain increase in the number of states during our nation's history. The range, then, would be the set of numbers from 26 to 100. Now let's return to Bill and Jane and the simple equation about their ages. As we saw, the solution set of this equation contains many ordered pairs. Here is the relationship between Jane's and Bill's actual ages now. The sum of their ages is 26 years. We can translate this into an equation, x plus y equals 26. Now, we can further limit the ages we can use, since we can see that Jane is probably not under 10 or over 13. So we will take the natural numbers from 10 through 13 as the domain of the new function. Now, what ordered pairs make the sentence x plus y equal 26 a true statement? 10 and 16. 11 and 15, 12 and 14, 13 and 13. This makes up the solution set of the equation. But notice, this ordered pair is the only one of the set that also belongs to the solution set of the first equation about Jane and Bill, x plus 2 equals y. 12 plus 2 equals 14. So Jane is 12 and Bill is 14 and the sum of their ages is 26. From these simple equations about Bill and Jane to the complicated equation that guides an airplane into a path of weightlessness is a big jump. But they all illustrate the use of equations, number sentences, which state that two expressions represent the same number. What a way to end a tranquil film about uh, numeric equations. Um, that reminds me, so during the Maps Are Fun, that uh, intro film of uh, sound, a soundtrack song, is also used in Our Obligation, uh, the film where uh, we see a fire in a school and see children jumping to their death. So that, that song it just, it's a setup. Like I hear it and I'm immediately a little anxious and I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> things are going to go horribly wrong. Um, <clears throat> that's the thing about reusing uh, songs uh, and background music is that uh, sometimes uh, a film might impress on you um, something. Um, 
Anyways, uh, yeah, I don't have another film set up. Um, but I very much appreciate you guys tuning in today. So tomorrow I've got a doctor's appointment, which is really annoying um, uh, because I'm going to have a surgical appointment on uh, next Monday um, to deal with this issue that I have related to a bike accident that I had when I was 12. So tomorrow's not going to be... I, I'm not sure if it's going to be live or not. I'm going to re pre-record a show. But if you are itching to see me show films live, you can go to DHL Library, uh, where I'll be doing a live screening uh, where I'm the expert. Uh, it's at the Airedale Cloyd Auditorium, where I saw countless 16mm uh, foreign films, part of their international film series. And uh, so I'll be there at 7 o'clock showing some films. Um, I haven't decided what I'm going to show yet because I, it's kind of a, it's like, yay, I get to show what I want. Um, so I have to make it kind of fit, um, and get people, students interested in it. Um, but, uh, yeah, seven o'clock free, um, uh, DHL library, which is on Hillsborough street. And then I may or may not be live tomorrow during my show, but I, otherwise I'll be back on Wednesday. It'll be great. Um, very much appreciate you guys tuning in and hope you have a great rest of your day. If you like what you saw, hit the thumbs up, hit the like button. Um, then also you can uh, support us by using the super thanks button, which Jeremy did earlier. Thank you, Jeremy. Or go to ko-fi.com slash avgeeks or patreon.com slash avgeeks. Those are all great ways to say thank you. All right, everybody have a great rest of your Monday. It's nice outside, it's not rainy and gross, so maybe I'll do some chores outside. Ah, take care. <laughs>